Hello again, everybody. Um, I guess this will be the second and last uh, lecture on, um, on this topic, so I'm not saying yes, thanks. Uh, I, uh, I'll start by reviewing a little bit the things we discussed mostly in the tutorial uh, and move on to what I'm really interested in today, interested in today which is uh, the four dimensional, full four dimensional case. Um, and solid on in, in that situation. But uh, what we did um, in the tutorial, of course, we looked at 1 plus 1 D problems, and uh, in particular the, the sand border model, which I'm not going to uh, review now in detail. But the main thing that we made use of was that if you have a 1 plus 1 dimensional Lagrangian, Lagrangian density, uh, so R phi is a function of x and t, and uh, then we have a Lagrangian like that, uh, and this uh, is our um, uh, potential. And what we assumed was that uh, we have, you know, so that u has some kind of behavior like this, where maybe there's a phi minus and a phi plus, where now these are different minima of the potential. And we required, and of course these are the value up, because these are uh, field configurations. This is phi, we're plotting u here, u of phi. These are field configurations where phi is constant, so if you were to minimize the uh, energy for, for this uh, kind of Lagrangian, then you would end up with uh, um, uh, these as being the value up. So we care about solutions which interpolate between these value up. So you want phi of x to go to, say, phi minus, as x goes to minus infinity, and you want phi of x to go to phi plus as x goes to plus infinity. Uh, again, I'm not going to review the whole, um, uh, the whole story, but the main uh, point that we made use of in order to quickly at least get uh, some solutions that have behavior like that. Okay, So at minus infinity, you're here, then at plus infinity, you want to be here. So you want not, of course, a, you want a static solution. So not depending on time, but now you want to allow it to depend on space because you want it to interpolate between two solutions like that. And uh, one of the nicest um, ways of seeing uh, how this works is this argument of um, uh, Okomomi. Uh, where you start off with um, this expression here, by prime plus minus uh, q phi which is obviously positive. And from this, you can derive that your um, uh, energy of the configuration, uh, you, can, you can square this, and this part and that part, the square parts, are uh, proportional to the energy of a static configuration. So your energy uh, will have to be, which is equal to, your energy is going to be the integral of plus u of phi, uh, okay, from minus infinity to infinity, and that you can rewrite as larger than equal than this, um, as we showed in the tutorial, but not a beautiful argument, okay. using, uh, starting from this, taking the immediate terms on the right hand side, I've made a choice of sign at some point, but uh, the, the, this gives you a nice bound on the energy. Okay, of a configuration like that, which interpolates between phi minus and phi plus. And what will be important for us is the equality here. So if you just take this to be exactly equal, then you get a solution which saturates this bound. So basically, the energy is the lowest it can be in this given topological sector. Okay, so remember, I defined a number um, n to be phi plus minus phi minus over 2 pi. And in this topological sector, you, if you want to have the minimum energy, then you can easily find it by making this um, vanish. And where does it happen? It happens when, uh, like this, phi prime equals plus minus. So this is a first order equation, the book of equation, which uh, tells you uh, what your uh, which is easier to solve than you know, the generic um, equations of motion that you might have for your given system. 
and we, we showed how this can be solved in the special case of Sandborn. Uh, and what we found is, as perhaps uh, I expected, uh, this kind of um, uh, a, a kind of king solution, which uh, kind of goes like this, uh, and it uh, uh, it interpolates between two possible factors. We had chosen one of them to be phi equals zero, so now I'm to phi as a function of x. So it interpolates between phi equals zero and some non-zero value, okay? uh, which was uh, in that case the one corresponding to n equals one. So basically, that value here is two pi. And we showed explicitly by writing down that funny uh, expression that phi was you know, proportional to, uh, or it was equal to uh, some, complicated, uh, some complicated function uh, that um, some arc tan of exponential x minus a. We showed that we can explicitly write a solution that has it. Anyway, uh, I'm going to, okay, this was just a reminder. I'm going to now want to move on. Uh, from this uh, to a higher dimensional situation. So, in order to motivate what the analogs of these things are going to be, uh, well, think of here, right? Uh, you have that, or, or let's say it's say condition here. Uh, you have that your phi interpolates between two different vacuum, right? Uh, at minus infinity and plus infinity. So, actually, what Regardless of how the, solutions, uh, the solution looks, if you want to know the energy of that particular solution, actually all you need to do is subtract the solution here and the solution there, and that will give you the energy, I mean, times perhaps a constant okay here, but uh, it will give you the energy of the solution, okay, because that's the solution that minimizes this. So the fact that actually it's only the boundary uh, of your field which is relevant for, for the energy of the field, that, that is going to be what we want to generalize to higher dimensions. However, in higher dimensions, uh, so suppose now we're, we're not working with, uh, with our axis, right? The boundary is not going to be just two points. Right? Here, the boundary of, of our world, of our space, is just these two points, plus or minus infinity. In general, we want to uh, consider the boundary of space time. So, for instance, if we were working in uh, 2 plus 1 and you had x and y, uh, the boundary at, at infinity is a circle. Right? So, what we're actually going to be looking at is the field can, uh, as, so if you look at the configuration of the field, it can do whatever it wants in the middle, but what's going to be interesting uh, for finding the energy in the end is going to be actually the, the boundary value of our field, basically the asymptotic value as we go to infinity in each direction. Now this need not be constant. The field does not need to go to the same value uh, all um, uh, every <coughs> point at infinity. What values can it go to? Well, of course we want something with a solution, and the assumption is <coughs> that uh, well at, at infinity are because we want finite energy that uh, the field will actually end up becoming. Uh, constant, okay, uh, in direction. So, so because we want to get rid of kinetic energy, and uh, so we will make that assumption. So basically, at infinity, as x, but now x i, which could be two or three, depending on the dimension, as that goes to infinity, well, we want the field to to reach uh, the, a minimum of uh, of the potential. So, we, and we can choose that minimum. To be zero. Okay. So we want the field to reach a vacuum uh, at um, at infinity, and we can call this. So basically, the, the solutions for phi, for which the potential gets minimized at infinity, uh, is known as the vacuum manifold, and we can call it uh, well, we can call it curl v. So basically what we want that as x goes to infinity, we want phi to belong to this vacuum manifold. Right? So is it what I'm trying to do? And it's the same thing that I'm doing here. I want phi to be a solution at minus infinity and plus infinity, but now I want to generalize this to more dimensions. 
Now, what's the, now why is this non-trivial? What's the interesting part? Well, this vacuum manifold can have a non-trivial structure. And I'm going to see an example of what non-trivial geometrical structure this manifold can have. So what is actually relevant and what we care about, because here we care about okay, how many possible vacuum we have. In this potential, we only have two. How many possible, what is the geometry of this manifold of vacua that you can have at infinity uh, is a more general question. And phi is a map, assuming that, uh, so this is, this is phi, let's call this phi infinity. So basically, that's my asymptotic value of phi. This will depend on my coordinates. So it will be different at every coordinate, in every coordinate. The asymptotic value clearly is going to be a map from the boundary of space-time, which we can call uh, the, the sphere, let's say d minus 1 sphere to infinity. Here I drew a circle, because I'm in two dimensions. This is d. But let's generalize. If we're three dimensions, then we have a two sphere at infinity. And the field, the solution, is going to be a map from this to our vacuum. And any questions about what I'm trying here? This is all the requirement that I'm not talking about solitons at this stage or, or, or anything, I'm just saying that, well, given some field which depends on x everywhere, take it to infinity, you want it to be a solution. Okay, everywhere, but I mean. Uh, at infinity, you want to be a solution that has no, uh, it should be static, it should be constant, and uh, that means that asymptotically it should belong to this vacuum manifold, and uh, it, which, which I call V, I'll define V better uh, in a minute, and that means that we need to uh, consider maps of like this. Now, of course, now the, the, there's a big theory behind these kinds of maps, and especially be, between. Uh, about uh, regarding maps between spheres and different um, uh, different manifolds here, uh, we're only going to consider really one case, which is that this vacuum like, manifold is also a sphere, which is actually quite a quite typical situation. So then we're talking about maps between different spheres. Okay. So between say the sphere at d minus one sphere at infinity and some S M sphere which will be the vacuum manifold. They don't have to have the same dimension. So again, what is the definition of V? It's all the points, uh, all the solutions in phi, because uh, U is a function of phi, so it's all the, all the phi's that give you... Um, so phi, of course, there's not only one. Uh, obviously, by writing this, I assume that I've generalized phi to be a multi-component scalar field, right? uh, because otherwise there's only one phi. Uh, like it was there. But now we can have multiple funds, and we'll see again a very interesting example in a minute, and uh, we can look at this. Now, does anybody know what these maps are called between spheres? And suppose we're all interested not in the specific maps, but we're interested in classifying these maps according to which ones cannot be continuously deformed to each other. Because if you can continuously deform a map to each other, it's basically the same as you know going from say phi minus to phi minus. So basically, your solution you could have some phi that at, you know is a bit different from at minus infinity to phi minus, then it becomes a bit different, but at plus infinity is also phi minus. Well, that thing you can deform it to a trivial solution without breaking any rules, without going through a region of infinite energy. We call this we call it already last time topologically trivial. Uh, what we care about is topologically non-trivial solutions, which means that we actually care about maps like these. So these are the five, right? These are our, our fields. Maps like these, which actually uh, cannot be continuously deformed. And if they cannot be continuously deformed, that means that for you to be able to take a file which belongs to one sector here, uh, and you want to deform it to another sector, you'll have to break it through some region of, you know, you have to break it somehow. You have to take it through some region of infinite energy. And that's not allowed in a physical situation. Mm -hmm. Mathematically, it's not allowed if you only look at continuous maps. Okay. Has anybody seen maps like these? Does anybody remember the name of how these classes are called? These classes of maps between spheres? Okay, it's one of, it's a, of course a classic um, 
example or a classic um, subject in, um, in topology, and uh, I will be calling them homotopy classes. You know? So these are again maps from a sphere of a different dimension to another sphere of another dimension. And this can be classified, of course, it's, for, uh, it's a fundamental um, old subject in topology. And we're only going to care about a couple of them. Of course, it can get quite complicated, but for the physical situations we have in mind, uh, let, let's do, can just do a couple of examples uh, just to get a feeling of how these things look like. Okay. So, for instance, uh, we can consider maps from the circle. Suppose we're in a 2 plus 1, so our boundary is the circle. So we want to look at maps from S1 to other spheres. And let's, for instance, take a circle. So what we want to do is map a circle to a circle. So these are my two circles. Don't get confused by this. These have totally different physical interpretations. This is the circle which is the boundary to infinity. So this is the circle in the X space. This is the circle which describes, I haven't explained this, but uh, we will see an example. It describes uh, the, the possible values of phi, which minimize the potential. Okay. So these things are not connected with each other in any way in general, but asymptotically, because we want to have a finite energy configuration, that's what's, connect, uh, that's what's connecting them. Okay. Because you want phi to be a solution. Right? <laughs> so let's parameterize this by some theta, this by some phi. Phi is not the same phi, right? This is just an angle. And you want to map theta to phi. Right. Now, there are many ways of doing it. What's the simplest way you can imagine having a map, which you know has the usual nice properties of maps, uh, that goes from theta to phi? Identity. Okay, what, what is the identity? Theta equals phi. Yeah. So you can have, or let's say, that, let's try the other way around, that phi equals theta. That takes every point on this circle to every point on this circle. Right? Okay. So, oops. Okay. Now that's a nice map. But this is not the only map that you can write. Okay. Uh, so here we care, of course, about maps which are continuous, right? So they have to satisfy some periodicity condition. You cannot, uh, you cannot just arbitrarily stop a map. Um, anywhere, but there is of course a map which which takes all the points in theta to just one point. Yeah. That is also a map that we can consider. But that's this map that we drew, the, the first map that we drew, which basically takes you can write, draw it like this. Okay, so for every point in in, uh, in this S1, you've mapped the other S1. The question is, can I continuously deform this map? to the trivial map, where it means basically that all the points just go at one point. All the points are mapped to a single point. Okay, so that, that's a trivial map. Every point here goes to a single point. <coughs> Can I do that? Without breaking my circle? So if you could do that, then it would be no point in locking your bicycle, right, on anything, on a pole. Because uh, if, you have a, if you have a pole and you, know, you want to remove uh, the lock, well, you could just uh, map it to a trivial map and you know, take the bicycle away. But the fact that we lock our, our bicycles with a circle uh, around some other circle, which is basically the, you know, the, the cross-section of a pole, means that we trust that this cannot be done unless somebody actually breaks the chain, right, or brace, or you know, bike lock. So the, these two maps, the trivial map, were basically all, so f, f of theta is a single value, like, you know, theta is, is some single phi, some phi zero, let's say, here. This map and the map where theta equals phi are in different topological sectors. But, but there are more of these maps. And uh, to cut a long story short, I mean, you can, if you have these two circles, so this is my original circle, this is my uh, 
uh, my target circle. You can imagine, also you can do this with your bicycle if you like, you can imagine wrapping it twice. Right? So, you can imagine this, it, this is, this is a, a, a nice sort of continuous map. It's double volume, right? but that's not for, for, for the problem. Now, how do you drive the map like this? So, again, this is uh, theta, this is phi. So, let me start from theta equals 0, that map to phi equals 0, right up here. Then, as I increase my theta, okay, theta equals pi still maps to phi equals pi. Theta equals 2 pi will map to phi equals 2 pi. And then, what happens? kind of overcounting, what you actually want is when you start from here and you and you go to, to phi equals uh, to theta equals pi, what you want is to have covered this once already. Right? So how do you achieve that? What's the map that will make half a turn in theta cover a whole turn in phi? What does phi have to be in the theta? Two. Right? So the map is simply so then when you cover this circle once, you've covered this twice, right? Because this would be four by. And you can do it three times. So a map, that map would be five plus three, uh, five plus three theta, four theta. You can do it a negative amount of times because that just means doing it the opposite direction. That's just a map of the opposite direction. So basically what you find is that you can classify these maps by the integer number, where z equals 0 is the trivial map that I discussed earlier, where everything just maps to a single point. That's, that's trivial. And topologically, all these maps are distinct. Okay. So that mathematically you can write as that uh, pi 1 of s1 is equal to z. So basically, that means the first homotopy group uh, of that space a circle is the integer. And it's actually a general uh, statement that if you have the same, uh, the same dimensions here, so if I'm mapping not a circle but a sphere, a d-sphere, to a d-sphere, that is also z. It, a, a simple way to see if it's the z equals, uh, so the z equals 1 map for the two-dimensional case is to take an orange, right? And if you have an orange, there's the peel and there's the sphere inside the orange. And now you can ask, can this, uh, can this peel be removed without cutting it anywhere? If you could do that, then uh, that would mean that the, this map, okay, so think of the, the angles parameterizing the peel and the angles parameterizing the orange, they're one to one, so that would be the equivalent of the phi equals theta map that I wrote down there. But if you could just remove the peel without cutting it, then that would mean that you know that map is equivalent to the trivial map. Because the trivial map is one where you know the, the peel can be actually taken off. But of course, as you probably know, that you have to actually bite into the orange or cut it somehow in order to remove the peel. You cannot just take it. Okay. So this is a so that, okay. There's a lot more to say, and I, I don't have time because I want to go back into um, physical consideration. But uh, Maybe we can do a final example, just to see an example where this is not Z, just to be a bit, of, a bit more complete. So, suppose I were to take a, a map from a circle, but this time to a two-sphere. If you were to guess what this map is going to be, class corresponds to. So roughly the way you should think is that I'm taking my circle, now I have my, my two-sphere, and I can map my circle on the two-sphere, right? So I can, I can draw basically a circle. I can map it in any way I like, it doesn't have to be. Okay, maybe I map it like that. Now can I continuously deform this thing to the trivial map? Okay, 
I see some nodding. Yeah, so basically I can always take this map continuously while breaking it to a point. So in, so in that case, I'm, uh, I'm dealing with uh, a, a trivial map. And of course, okay, this is just, a, uh, just an intuitive example, but you cannot really, uh, it turns out that yeah, there, you cannot write down non-trivial maps from a circle to a sphere, but maps that you cannot uh, take to zero. So this would be zero. And so on. Now, the reason that I'm going through this very okay, quickly uh, is that uh, these topological considerations are exactly what we're going to need when we discuss uh, higher dimensional versions of these sort of tonic like solutions that we saw in the uh, uh, in the San Gordon or in the one plus one dimensional case. Okay, just because now we're going to be looking at maps from our asymptotic x space, x, y, z, whatever coordinates, to our Viking map, which is now not going to be points, it's going to be a non trivial topological. Um, so I have plans to say quite a lot, but I think I will, since I only have about 10-15 minutes left, as you can see, uh, I will kind of be quick. And first I will introduce quickly uh, the concept of uh, monopoles. Because these are going to be the kinds of solutions that we, uh, that we actually care about. And, well, a monopole is uh, easy to describe uh, what we want. Remember Maxwell's equations. Uh, let me write a couple of Maxwell's equations here. Okay, so then the, so there's the Gauss law, there's Faraday's equation. There's the corresponding magnetic uh, version of Gauss and uh, the Ampere law. And of course, I've put things like speed of light and the electric constants to one. Okay, just for simplicity, just to show the, the argument. Well, what's a monopole? Well, when I say monopole, we typically mean magnetic monopole. So the idea was well, why don't, if we have this, right? So this is the electric charge density, which appears in the Gauss law. Why can't we have an analog of that for the magnetic Maxwell equation? So why not have an R B, uh, which is, uh, or maybe R magnetic, R magnetic, which uh, satisfies the same kind of equation? Wouldn't, wouldn't it look so much nicer? Wouldn't the world be so beautiful if we had? You know, uh, this term in the Maxwell equations. Then we don't have to you know, remember that one of them has a right-hand set and one doesn't. That, that, that was the idea. And there are many immediate problems with this. Uh, one of them is, um, like, if you, if you assume that this is true, okay, this is your magnetic field, then you suppose, suppose we have that, then if you take the Faraday equation and you take its divergence, okay, uh, then maybe maybe you're so this is zero. Maybe you're familiar with what, what this is. Yeah. So this is the div curl identity as the call. This should be zero. So what you'd find is uh, that um, well, if, if you plug in now the right hand side of this, because this is now d over d b equals zero. What you'll find is that this row. Uh, magnetic has to be constant, okay? Because uh, the, this would be zero. So if there's a right hand side, this would have to be zero, and that would mean that you know whatever happens in the universe, of course, the universe is expanding, whatever, the, the magnetic um, uh, density is going to stay constant, but that doesn't make much physical sense. So the density is, you know should be able to actually change if you change the volume. So this is one issue that people really have. There's a more theoretical sort of um, issue as well, which we're actually going to discuss uh, a little bit, is that normally, those of you who've done uh, field theory or perhaps slightly more advanced uh, thermodynamics know that we like to introduce what we call a gauge potential, okay? 
which is uh, defined, at the vector part at least of the gauge potential is defined like this. Okay. And now the problem is by the same identity is that now if, if you assume that the, the, our magnetic field can be derived through a potential and then you, you again do the same, right? Well, this is zero, so automatically, of course, the right hand side needs to be zero. So the requirement, of course, uh, you can say why do I need this gauge potential, but as you probably know, it's very fundamental in many of the things that, uh, that we do uh, in, um, uh, in, in, in field theory and in quantum field theory. So this is what actually becomes, uh, when we, after you quantize, which actually becomes the photon. So, you know, we, we, we don't really want to not have this gauge potential. So, but it seems to preclude having a right-hand side to the Gauss law, just, just by this logic. And despite all this, so this doesn't sort of bode well for having magnetic monopoles, despite this, Dirac actually, you know, beautifully introduced magnetic monopoles for electromagnetism by making just one assumption uh, which is actually quite, uh, in retrospect, is quite obvious, was that this A, which was kind of the problem, need not be globally defined. Right? So what you can do is you can write down a magnetic uh, uh, monopole field, so write, write a magnetic field like this, Now this is something which is uh, spherically symmetric. So if you were to plot this, uh, you know, uh, this each component of B is proportional to uh, to a given x. So you know this looks like this, depending on the sign of g, of course. So this is what we would think of as a, the field, the magnetic field created if there were to exist a magnetic monopole. Now, what's the the problem with this? Well, there are, there are a couple of problems, uh, and I'll Again, because I want to reach the actual magnetic monopoles I care about, I'm not going to discuss all the problems. But obviously, this is singular at zero, right? So at r equals zero, this has a singularity, and it turns out that if you want to write uh, a gauge potential, you you can do that, okay? But you cannot write the gauge potential which is valid everywhere. You need to define it, and, but that's fine because the poten potential is a function on our manifold. So it, it's okay if it, it's not globally well defined, as long as you can patch it nicely. Okay, so what, uh, what Dirac proposed is that if you write down a. It's a right hand against potential. Uh, let, me, let me just quickly write it, just to keep your feeling. It's not that complicated. 2 for 4 by r cos theta minus 1 over sine theta. And uh, it's kind of a form, so you can write it as minus sine phi cos phi and 0. By the way, this discussion I'm taking from a nice book on topological solitons by Manton and Sutcliffe, okay. which you can ask me about if you if you want to take the reference, but that's where I'm taking the discussion. So this is, uh, okay, these are the three components of the, of the field. I um, think this is a row, so this is basically x, y, and z, but it's a row because it's actually a form, so when you write it as a form, it should be like the dx component, and all that. And there's actually an a2, which is the same, roughly, apart from the fact that uh, here you put a plus one. Now, because of this, you can see that this, now if you were to write down our, our usual spherical coordinates, so this is theta, this is r, and this is phi. Now phi goes from 0 to 2 pi, r goes from 0 to infinity, theta goes from 0 down to pi. Right? Okay, uh, everybody familiar with uh, standard spherical coordinates on a, on a three-dimensional space? Uh, but now, I've moved already to, to 3 plus 1 dimensions. But now you can see the problem here, that this connection, uh, if I were to put, uh, say, theta equals, um, uh, well, you can, you can see from here uh, that this, if I were to put theta equals pi, 
right? So what's the value of cosine theta to pi? Minus one, so this is something non-zero, but what's the value of sine theta, right? So, so this diverges at theta equals pi. However, if I were to write this other solution, which is also a solution of my Maxwell equations, but I write the plus one, then this is well-defined at theta equals pi, and not well-defined at theta equals zero. So basically what you have to do is assume that one of the, so this gauge potential, the first one, is well-defined in some, some region of theta, the other one, so this is where a1 is, is fine, in the other part, maybe up to here, let's say you can have a2, and then you just need some overlap function between them. Look at this, this has defined for you a, a connection, and you can write down an overlap function, and okay, if I had more time, I would spend more details, that overlap function is not um, globally defined. Uh, it, it's not single valued, actually, uh, because if you write it down, this overlap function looks like minus g over 2 pi phi. And you can see that at phi equals 0, this is equal to 0, that's the overlap between these two things. Uh, if you go around to phi equals 2 pi, then this is not zero, this is equal to minus g. So this is not uh, a single valued uh, uh, transition function, but that's not, that's not a problem unless uh, that leads to some physical issue with, with the things that are charged, the fields which are charged under this magnetic field. And to do that, okay, and now I'm gonna introduce some elements from QFT that may, some of you might not have seen, but but hopefully the argument will still be clear. Uh, you, uh, you know that we, r we usually write, um, so basically if you, if you have a field phi which transforms, which is coupled to our field, it's going to transform like e to the minus i e times actually this function, which does the gauge information between these two things. So suppose you do a gauge information to go from the first domain to the second domain. This is how my field is going to transform. Roughly, if I have more space, okay, let me write here that A2 is going to be A1 minus this transition function, so derivative of A1. Okay. You might have seen something similar to this when you do case information. And the problem only arises if this thing is not single valued. There's an E there, you can also put an E here because that's how the uh, coin derivative acts. So if you plug in this value, which is the correct value to do this transition, and you plug in E, you find that actually everything is fine as long as E times G is 2 pi times 72. Because this has a G, there's an over 2 pi, as long as this thing is 2 pi n, then there is no problem. The, the, the field that approximately, sorry, there, there should be a 2 pi here, uh, because the idea is that this goes around once. So actually, what, what, what the condition that you want is that phi at, phi at small phi equals 0 and phi at small phi equals 2 pi are the same thing. So actually, here there is a, there's a value. So as long as this condition is satisfied, you're happy. So you can allow monopole charge as long as it is proportional to 2 pi n over the electric charge. Okay. Now, Dirac was very clever, and you know, he, he took this argument uh, he, the other way around. He, he said that, well, assuming that there is a single monopole in the universe, we just need one, that explains the quantization of the electric charge. Because the electric charge should be quantized in the units of this n just because our field needs to be single valued. The fields that are electrically charged need to be single valued as you take them around this monopole. Okay, so take small phi from 0 to 1. So that was the next argument, which is kind of nice. But let me sketch now Okay, you can take it seriously or not. I mean, of course, uh, many people are taking this argument quite seriously. That's one of the physical motivations to search for magnetic monopoles. So these kinds of particles which uh, you know, 
might have a behavior like that, that might source the magnetic field. No, none of it has been seen so far, uh, but searches are ongoing. So perhaps there is actually a new kind of particle that will behave as a magnetic particle, and that would be actually quite nice in terms of compensation of magnetic field. But what I want to do in the next um, 10 minutes is just give you a feeling of uh, how this stuff extends uh, to non abelian gauge theory. Because that's where the Bogomolny argument actually was first um, introduced, and that's where you know, it, it has led to you know, lots of uh, studies and interest. <coughs> so, and now I'm going to, uh, without any warning, go into four dimensional field theory uh, language. So, I'm going to write down um, a young Mills. Higgs um, theory, or at least equations of motion, or such a theory. And of course, the, the Young Mills uh, field you might be uh, familiar with, you would write it as the Lagrange minus one quarter FD in the field. And then you couple this to a Higgs field, and what's the Higgs field? The Higgs field is a um, is a scalar field. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this uh, as, um, uh, as an adjoint field. And I'm going to take my gauge group to be SU2. And when I do that, actually my phi is now not a simple phi, because it's in the adjoint representation. And maybe you can tell me what is the dimension of SU2 and thus of the adjoint. So SU2 as a group. So how many generators does SU2 have? Three, right? So that means that phi, since it's the adjoint, has three components. And I can write them roughly as, uh, okay, the, 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 here I'm using some funny notation uh, I'm following still with the Mandelon Sutcliffe book. You can choose any uh, convention you like, but you can write it as um, uh, here I think my notation is I. So these are the components, uh, and sorry, let me write my field form as the components times I times the Pauli matrix. So my phi is a two by two matrix, Hermitian two by two matrix, because of um, it's Written like that as a linear combination of the Pauli matrices, and you can, uh, because of this, because it's a matrix, it's actually best to write as a trace, because now I have a matrix, right? So it, uh, you can write as a trace, and the reason for the funny minus a quarter is something that you can check, uh, is that if you take the trace of phi squared, that is actually equal to um, minus 2, this is the big file, which is the matrix, it's actually minus 2 of this because of these value conventions. So the half became. Now the reason, of course, okay, now I've coupled Young Mills theory uh, to a scalar field. Now the reason I'm calling it a Higgs. Of course, at this stage there is no Higgs, it's just a scalar field, a joint scalar field. The reason I'm calling it the Higgs is because there's also going to be a potential here, an interaction, which, if you continue from here, is going to be minus lambda over 4, 1 minus something like this, where phi squared, I'm just using a funny kind of notation, with, is minus a half trace. Phi as a field is traceless because these are traceless matrices, but phi squared is not traceless. It is squared. And if you were to do this calculation, you find the trace of this, uh, which depends on these small phi ends, then you get. Okay, so we have this. And I can ask you now what is the, 
the vacuum manifold. So where does this theory, which I will use here and here, where does it minimize its energy? Let's consider static configurations, and for the moment let's even consider configurations which do not depend on space. Well then, these contributions to the energy are going to vanish, and we only worry about the potential. Now if you want to plot this potential, in terms of phi, or phi squared, how does this look? When is it, where, where is its minimum for this potential? If you want to plot. Of course, the potential is plus this, right? This is in the Lagrangian, so the potential is the plus. So if I were to plot V or U as a function of, let's say, phi squared, where is its minimum? Is it at zero? I mean, is it when phi is zero, or is it somewhere else? Phi equals? One. Okay, so when phi squared is 1, the potential looks like this. Of course, there's quite a, if you, I'm not really supposed to plot phi squared here, I'm supposed to be plotting phi, so there's more dimensions okay, that, that I'm showing here. So what, what happens, this is the Higgs mechanism. Okay. And there is a vacuum manifold which basically are all the solutions to phi squared equals 1. That's a quadratic equation. What is it defined for you? Whenever you have some, you know, this is this, what this actually technically means is phi, you know, phi 1 squared plus phi b squared plus, sorry, phi 2 squared plus phi 3 squared equals 1 uh, up to some normalization. Okay, so it's some constant. Okay, so you have three coordinates, you're imposing one condition. How do you call a manifold that satisfies this? Yeah, it's a sphere. Right? It's an S2. So this manifold here will be an S2. In a, in a, in a more technical way of saying the same is, uh, well actually, sorry, let, let, me, let me say it a little bit uh, differently. I mean, the, 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 actual, the actual direction that you have is a U1 that actually is what, what takes you around this circle. So actually this is a U1, and the vacuum manifold itself is the group, which is SU2, divided by this, which is SU2 over U1, and that's, that's actually where the S2 is, it's not that necessarily. Okay. So because you are, you are looking at all the solutions that's... Uh, so basically what you've done is you divide up by a, a U1. What this tells you is basically, in this situation, in this kind of Higgs breaking, you have a photon, okay, which is a massless particle, similar to the usual standard model Higgs breaking, but now because you have an SU2, there's two more coordinates, and this you will identify with W plus minus particles. Okay, so your SU2 has split into a massless particle, which is the one that goes that direction, and, and your um, your coordinates uh, you, and your particles, these correspond to the particles that we plus that we want. And if you remember your standard model symmetry break, and those of you who've done the Higgs mechanism, what's missing? Is there something missing here? So whenever you see a photon, which corresponds to this U1, and to W's, what else do you expect to have? A Z, right? There is no Z in this model. Okay, so, and that's because this is not the physical model of Higgs, of the Higgs mechanism. Why? Because the Higgs in the standard model is not an adjoint field. Okay. So, and the gauge group is not a SU2, it's a SU2 times U1, it's an electroweak field. And so, when you have circuit breaking, you actually, you're still, what you're actually breaking here is actually the times one. Uh, the, the Higgs is very different, it look, it's a complex doublet. Okay, so the details are very different. Although this model was viable for a while uh, as a model of actual, um, of the actual standard model. But when people uh, discover neutral currents, so flavor changing neutral currents, which are made by the Z, then they knew that this cannot be the right model, and the Clash of Weinberg's lab model 
which has a thick doublet, was chosen, was realized to be the correct one. Anyway, this is not uh, important. This is not actually a physical model, but it's not important for us. What is important for, for us is to, to look at these uh, kind of maps. Uh, because what, we, what we're looking for here is solitons in this model. And uh, can I take three or four more minutes? Uh, I, I will just very qualitatively explain. And OK, if I have more time, I will sort of give all the details. But the question is, suppose you have this model. And let me write down uh, the, the 3D equations of motion for this. So assuming static, so I can get rid of uh, the, uh, the band direction, I can write something like this. Times phi and uh, d i f uh, i j. There's a summation here between the i's equals minus d j phi phi. So these equations here come from that model. Um, and it was uh, uh, one, one can study these equations, and that's what uh, Atkuft and Polyakov independently uh, did around the same time. And you can solve for phi. I mean, you can solve this coupled system of equations. It's not easy to do it in general, so it was actually mostly done numerically. But you can make some assumptions about how this uh, is going to look, and. Uh, you can, uh, you can write a solution which is roughly like, uh, like this. H of R, X A, T A. That's what Trost uh, and Polikov did. And then A I is something, something else. Okay, I don't, I don't have time to write it. You can solve for this H, and you can find, if you were to plot H, you can find a solution where this field inter interpolates, this is r, the radius, interpolates from 0 to some finite volume, well, actually to, to 1, at which case it reaches this vacuum configuration where phi is 1. So phi squared is 1 is when r goes to infinity in this kind of, uh, in this kind of field. So this is a field which interpolates between a trivial Higgs field at zero and a uh, non-trivial Higgs field at infinity. But what you can see is that at every direction, it depends on the direction x. So at every direction, uh, you actually choose a different generator, which is being picked out. So the, the, the symmetry breaking happens in a different way at every, at every point, in every direction. And to quickly some, uh, conclude what, what this what this has to do with BPS? Well, it was, uh, of course, these equations, again, this is numerical. They're very hard to solve. But uh, Parasit and Sommerfeld found how to actually solve this in the special case where lambda is 0. Okay, where basically you more or less turn off this interaction term, but still it's a very complicated problem. The problem remains, and you still require that that particular uh, boundary behavior that phi squared is 1 at infinity. You still require that even though you don't actually have to. And this, okay, I don't have the time to go through all the details, but uh, what uh, was realized by, okay, this was solved by uh, explicitly, but more or less by accident by Perset and Sommerfeld. So basically they guessed the answer. And then uh, Bogomolny came up with an argument in the lambda equals 0 limit uh, by writing down the energy trace pi i is an integral uh, plus trace. This is, this is the energy of such a field at lambda equals 0, d3x. And where this b is now a non abelian magnetic field, it looks like this. And by doing a very similar argument to the Bogomolny argument that we saw uh, in the tutorial and in the beginning of the lecture, so basically writing this, expressing this as something like this, di plus di phi squared, so trace. So you can show that this can be written like this as a square of something, plus a term, which is a total derivative, trace. Yeah. 
And this being a total derivative is something that can be evaluated purely at the boundary of space time. So then you can you can find a bound by saying, well, okay, and you can actually evaluate this, and it has a particular uh, value here. If you have the solution you can find, but this basically maps from uh, the S2 at infinity to this vacuum manifold S2. And we saw in the beginning of class uh, that that was an integer. These maps are parameters of an integer Z. So this thing here is actually uh, turns out to be minus 2 pi n. And if you want to saturate the bound, okay, so this again is this is still the energy what I'm drawing here. So if you want to have the lowest energy, well, this is fixed by the topological sector. It's basically the windings of your map that fix it. So what well, all you have to do is make sure this vanishes, that these solutions will actually saturate your bound. And uh, to conclude, this is the Bogomolny equation. Which is that vi equals minus vi. Okay, so this is the question that I was aiming uh, to reach. Sorry, it's a bit longer. We'll go more. So when you have this is your magnetic field, this is your Higgs field. When they are related like that, this is a covariant derivative, so it contains a derivative plus a gauge field, and the gauge field acts uh, like this because it's an adjoint, so it's an A. Okay, so there are two terms here, not, not one as you might be used to, because you might be used to fundamental Higgs field. This is not uh, this is a different story. This is how, how this looks. But these equations here are extremely interesting from a mathematical perspective. And you can solve them and you can find the Prasad solar field um, solution, which I did not show. And to conclude, okay, so we, we find that if solutions like this give you a nice uh, uh, Sort of right, nice monopole uh, which interpolates between zero and some non trivial vacuum configuration, so we call it a soliton. And just like the solitons that we discussed in uh, KTV are actually more like this San Gordon model, which could go through each other and not uh, be affected, uh, it turns out that you can actually add these. So if you want to go between the zero sector and the sector with two, with n equals two, you can actually literally add the two solutions. Basically, they, they add up. And this is the origin of this BPS mess that we always make use of in, um, in string theory, in quantum theory. So basically, the solutions of these are known as BPS after the Bogomolian Prasad Sommerfield. And they have this very special property of basically not having a force between them. So you can add more than one, even though the system is completely nonlinear. In the original system that you started with, this one, even at lambda equals zero, is a nonlinear system. But you can add them nicely. Physically, what happens is that these, these monopoles, if you have two monopoles at lambda not zero, they would repel each other, like Coulomb. Okay, so it's like having two north poles, you know, so they would, they would want to repel. What's happening here is the Higgs field is actually massless, and being a massless field, it mediates long-range interactions. So basically, the repulsion between them is balanced out by the attraction. Remember, the scalar fields attract, it's like gravity. And so if, so if, they have, uh, if you have spin zero or spin two, your interactions are attractive. So this balances the repulsive interaction that you have because the, these are two monopoles in the same chart. And this, uh, this statement turns out to work in many, many other cases. It works for extreme polarization of Nordstrom black holes in gravity. So if you take a gravitational theory, you find uh, extreme black hole solutions, meaning that the charge is balanced by the mass. Uh, those things would want to repel, suppose you put two of them, uh, but actually it turns out that the forces are precisely balanced by the gravitational analogy of, of this. Uh, the deep rays that many of you have seen are of a very similar type. If you have two deep rays, and again, this is my last diagram, just for those who have already seen some ATCFT, you might be familiar that you calculate interactions between deep rays by close string exchange between them. 
Now, there are some closed string fields which will give you an attractive interaction. But in a supersymmetric string theory, you would also have some Ramon Ramon fields which would give you the, which balance out this attractive interaction by a positive interaction, which means that now there is no force between these fields. So, all of this is basically analogies, but of course, generalizations of this basic argument of Pogamoli, and that's where the linearness comes from. Now, if I had another few lectures, I would discuss how this is related to supersymmetry, uh, because all of these equations actually turn out to have very beautiful embedding in supersymmetric theory, but uh, I think I'll just stop here and see if there are any questions.